Greetings class, Professor Steve here. Um, here we'll talk about um, two other forms of upwelling. So we already have um, all the pieces in place, all your knowledge uh, base is in place, and so now we're just going to sort of uh, point out where certain types of interactions of these things that you know about already um, cause various upwelling, similar similar to the to the way we did with equatorial upwelling. But let's remember that um, the point of of upwelling, or the 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 the, um, the important consequence of upwelling, um, is that we're removing this barrier, this stratification of the two layers, so that water from deep can be brought up to the surface. And when we bring up water from the deep to the surface, we bring with it all the fuels that we need for fueling primary productivity. Um, and uh, the, the biggest thing there are the excess of nutrients that we find in the deep water, but it's also things like oxygen and, and carbon dioxide. Okay, so coastal upwelling. So before we dive into coastal upwelling, we will just recap Ekman transport, right? Um, we talked about the Ekman spiral, talking about how the wind causes uh, with respect to, or with interacting with uh, uh, or I should say, the way the wind affects the water and is affected also by Coriolis causes this spiraling effect of the transport of water, but that the, the net transport of the water is to the right of the wind, right? 90 degrees to the right of the wind. So it's just a reminder. So what happens now if we have that effect where um, the wind is also interacting with the coastline? And it's not so much an interaction, but... Um, but a boundary. So what if it's constrained by a coastline? So let's say this is the east coast off the coast of New Jersey uh, and we have a northward wind. Okay, so we're in the northern hemisphere. The wind is blowing up along the coast here. What does it want to do? It wants to push the water this way, which is affected in terms of Ekman transport, would, would dictate that the water near the coast is moved to the right. Um, okay, so if this is ocean over here and the water moves to the right, then this water also will be kind of pulled along to replace this water that moves from here to here, right? But since this is coast, there's no water to replace that. So let's look at a 3D schematic of this, right? Here's our coast. The wind is blowing up the coast. Ekman transport pushes this surface layer wa of water away from the coast. So since it's coast, it's continent, it's land, there's no water here to replace that. So the only way place for the water to come from is from down deep. Water moves off here and is replaced from down deep. What happens when that, when we have that? Well, the same thing as equatorial upwelling, right? If we move the surface away and it has to be replaced by deep, then we breach that barrier. We bring up cold bottom water, which is full of nutrients, um, CO2 and oxygen, and that fuels primary productivity. Okay, that's coastal upwelling. It's as simple as that. Um, Ar Antarctic upwelling, <clears throat> based on the same phenomena, um, re removing water from the surface ocean that has to be replaced by the bottom, but it's driven a little bit differently. So we'll quickly review um, our wind patterns again, um, specifically with respect to Antarctica. We have um, a low, and then we have a high down here as well, right? Subpolar low, polar high, but then we have a subtropical high, right? So going from high to low, the winds are in this section. Going from high to low, the winds are in this section. So we're in the southern hemisphere, which means everything's deflected to the left, right? So the winds are going from high to low, deflected to the left, and pushing water that way. And they set up a current that we'll see in the in the next slide going going from west to east here. Now since there's no continents in the way down here, and we'll see that again in a minute too, we'll see that in a minute as well, um, there's just this current that goes around and around and around at this latitude. Now we have the wind here going from high to low, high to low, right, deflected to the left, pushing water in here the other way. Now down here is Antarctica, so around the coast we have one going this way, we have a, a current going this way, and a little bit further off the coast, basically between the subtropical high and the polar low, we have this other strong current going this way. And here they are, right? So we have the wind um, from the polar high to the low, and from the subtropical high to the low. Right? This one drives this current going around Antarctica in a counterclockwise um, path. That's the polar current. This wind pattern here drives this current this way, 
And again, you see there's no continents in their way, so they just kind of are continual, con continual and very strong. And this one's the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, right? So we have one current going this way and one current going against it the other way. And we call that countercurrents. So what is that? What is that? What's the consequence of that? Okay, so here is a um, a cross section of what that would look like. If this is Antarctica, okay, over here we have the um, Antarctic circumpolar current coming at us, right? So symbolized as the point of an arrow coming at us out of the page. Over here we have the polar current going away from us. So these are those two currents going counter to each other, but we're just looking at a cross section of it, right? So this one's going away from us into the page, this one's going away from us coming at us out of the page. Um, so if if this is going at us out of the page, um, well, let's start with this one. If this one's going into the page, then the water that's, that travels with it in the surface um, due to Coriolis will be slightly deflected to the left as well, right? So towards the continent, to the left in the southern hemisphere, right? This one's coming, out of, coming at us out of the page, um, and the water that it drives in the surface is deflected to its left, which coming at us is actually our right, but deflected to its left in the southern hemisphere. So we have water moving this way from this current, we have water in the surface moving this way because of this current, and these two are going away from each other, so what do we call that? A divergence, right? And this, this specific long-term phenomenon is actually called the Antarctic Divergence. When you have a divergence, that means the surface waters are moving away from here, it needs to be replaced from somewhere, and hopefully you guessed it by now, that's right, it gets replaced from down below, right? So what does that cause? An upwelling event. So now, the other thing that helps is in the Antarctic, um, the water is, is so cold in the surface, um, it doesn't really get um, really hot and really super stratified from the bottom. So there's stratification here. There's a surface ocean and there's a deep ocean, um, but it's not as stratified as say near the equator, where 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 the summer is so much warmer and less dense than than the deep. So this upwelling is a little bit easier to generate. So now let's look at a map again of global average production um, and now we can start to pick out the three different types of upwelling we've gone over so far right last this the the past lecture the last lecture was equatorial upwelling we could see a big stripe of that um, so this is if we added up the 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 measurements of chlorophyll a in the surface from a satellite um, and averaged it across the whole year we see that there's this huge sections of equatorial upwelling that we get right here and here, right, all along the equator. Um, and this is the most persistent. It, it happens um, for the majority of the year, right? Um, but then we can look um, along the coast here, along these coasts, right? So it's generally eastern or uh, these coastal areas where we get wind going either south on a western current or north and an eastern I should not uh, I'm sorry south on a on a, a western continental coastline or north on an eastern coastline in the northern hemisphere where the wind is is blowing along the the coast pushing the water offshore and causing all these upwelling in these little sections right and we also see it in Ant in the Antarctic upwelling. Um, Whereas we don't see uh, a, a quite as high a global average, but you can see this is not dark blue, but a purple. Um, so, th so it's this kind of low-level persistent production due to that upwelling in the in Antarctica. Um, so that's that's pretty much the summary, and it really points out. Um, where the majority of production occurs, and it's in these it's in these sections. Um, where we get upwelling along the coasts, along the equator, and all the way around Antarctica.